So we'll have lightning talks here, which are basically five-minute talks uh, that everyone can give if he manages to register uh, in time. And sometimes we also have three-minute talks, but I think in this session we'll only have five-minute talks. To make sure that every speaker uses only five minutes, we have this nifty device called Timekeeper, which uh, Alex constructed. Would you like to say something about that? Yeah, I will give a short introduction. Uh, on the first four minutes of your five-minute talk, uh, everything will be green. You just don't need to hurry. And during the first four minutes, the screen column rises up uh, until it's on top. And if it's like this, you'll still have one minute left. And in the last minute, it starts uh, becoming yellow from the bottom up. And for 30 seconds, you have a yellow light. And when it's this way, you still have 30 seconds left. And only if the red light is on top, like for instance that, you know uh, there is a moment when it's like this. And I show you this. Yeah. The no, we start at five. <laughs> we don't <laughs> want to get into the last te 10 seconds. We try it again. Five, <laughs> four. four. Three, Three, two, two one. one. Uh, marvelous. Okay. I think we can work with that. Uh, I mean, it's day four, so everyone is a bit uh, uh, tired. So if you're a speaker and you don't know when your talk is supposed to be, you can recheck your time slot at the um, mirror wiki, because the other wiki is a bit flaky right now. I couldn't update it today. Um, so this is the address for the mirror wiki, and just go to the lightning talk page there and you can see your time slot. Now, if you're a speaker, please sit in front somewhere. If you know your talk is going to come up soon, and then uh, get up as soon as the previous talker has finished. Exchange the clicker. You will need this to advance the slides. Just press on the right button. Don't, don't miss the right button, because then you, this happens. So uh, yeah, but this uh, blackout button is rather small, so everything should work fine. Then uh, the important thing is to talk into the microphone and not turn around and look at the slides and talk on, because we can't uh, understand you, especially the people in the stream don't like it if they hear, don't hear anything. So you can see your slides down there on this monitor and also the timekeeper. Just You b basically see the same picture as uh, up there. So trust, tr trust the monitor. It really yeah. is the same picture as up there. It's your friend. The mic and the monitor are your friends. So since the wiki was down, I don't have all the contact info and all the description for all talks. Um, so if you would like your information to be preserved for future generations, then try to create a lightning talk page in the wiki. I tried it to, uh, this, this morning. It didn't work. But uh, you can maybe check from time to time. And once you have created this page, I can later on uh, put it into the schedule. And then your, the people have a link where they can click on and look up your contact info and your talk description and maybe your slides if you uploaded them. So if you would like that, then please try to create a lightning talk page in the wiki. I think it will be online after the Congress for at least a few days and editable. There's also a translation available. The English talks will be translated into German, German talks into English. Just call DECT number 8014 for Saal G, and uh, every talk should be translated. Yeah. Um, let's take this moment to give a big hand to the translation people, because they're really doing an awesome job. <laughs> especially with the lightning talks with all these different topics. So then I think we can begin. Have a great session. So I'll uh, start the first talk, which is going to be Spatial Spread of Student Hackathons. Well, that's a nice start. Is the talker here? Again, spatial spread of student hackathons. Nobody. Yeah, yeah there's some some karaoke here. <laughs> hmm, that's that's uh, yeah, that's a bit sad. So, I guess the speaker is not there. Hmm. Yeah. Then no, we it would be stupid if we now sit here for five minutes. Uh, um, I think we just go on, then. Take this away. Maybe he got stuck in an elevator. Or maybe he didn't get a ticket. Maybe. 
But that was another person that, uh, uh, yeah, never mind. Then, then we'll just continue with Perl 6. This may come as a surprise. Uh, so your talk is up now, Perl 6, are you there? <laughs> That's nice. Okay, hey, hello, Perl fans. So I'm Ingo, and I'm here to convince you that Perl 6 is a beautiful, nice language worth looking at. So let me remark that I'm actually not a Perl 6 developer, uh, but I used to be one. In fact, almost uh, 10 years ago, I gave a talk at a regional Linux conference titled Perl 6 Just Now, and <laughs> I agree that the title was maybe a little bit premature. Um, at that time, I was hacking on Pux, a very fun project where we tried to build a prototype compiler for Perl 6 and Haskell. This project was led by my personal hero, namely Audrey Tang, and was really, really nice. Um, anyway, I am sorry to say that the joint release of Perl 6 and GNU Hurt was cancelled, and, uh, and so after years of announcing that Perl 6 would be released at some unspecified Christmas as the future, I hope that you're now as happy as this camel that it was actually released a couple of days ago. Okay, so uh, Perl 6 is not source level comp compatible with Perl 5, but still you can use Perl 6 modules from Perl 5 and vice versa, it works rather great. So let's dive straight in. Here's a short example program. So you still have the secrets, but they are invariant now. So in line uh, two, you see basic input-output, and also from line three, you can infer that everything is an object in Perl 6, just like in Python or Ruby. So, and you can use either object-oriented notation for calling a method or a procedural one. Then in the next block, you see a for loop. Uh, there you have, like in Ruby, a block which gets a parameter, i, and this block gets passed into the for function. In fact, the for function is nothing magical. You can define your own control structures if, you, if the need arises. They, they are just special subroutines which get a block, right? Uh, in line 10, you see that Perl 6 is still an operator-based language. So uh, there's a principled way to create new operators out of given ones. This one is called an hyper-operator. If you have like an ordinary operator, in this case the star, then you could, can put brackets around it, and then it will be an operator which you can apply to a list. And uh, the result will be that the operator is applied to between any two elements of the list. So this is a nice way of calculating the factorial of six. And finally, in the last uh, line, you see uh, another way of systematically creating new operators out of given ones. Uh, this is operator for doing component-wise addition. So you have one plus three, two plus five, and three plus six. Here's how you do object orientation in Perl 6. So you have a class keyword, a proper keyword, you have inheritance, you can define accessors. If you want to, you, are, uh, you will also have, like, get automatically created getters and setters. In line three, you see a subtyping declaration. So the name of such a kit uh, should, uh, should consist, consist only of uppercase letters. Uh, if you want to, you can also give a proper name to this subtype and then use it several times. Uh, also, typing is optional in Perl 6, but it's available if you want to. This is called gradual typing. And from line six, you can infer that Perl 6 has a proper like method pa uh, argument passing uh, declaration. Yeah? So you can declare many parameters. The question mark indicates that one of those is optional. Uh, you can also uh, create, declare named uh, parameters. It's very nice. Finally, uh, let me mention rules. Rules are the, uh, like the outgrowth of regular expressions. They are vastly overhauled. The main difference to regular expressions uh, are the following. Firstly, uh, they are not, no longer white space sensitive. So you can insert white space and also comments into rules so that you can deobfuscate your regular expressions. And secondly, you, uh, so if a match succeeds, you do not only have like um, groups, pattern groups, which you like the first, the second, and the third for looking into the match, uh, but you get a fully fledged uh, path tree, which you can then further process. Okay, so that was it. I hope you are convinced that Perl 6 is at least looking at, at. it was 
uh, in development for a long time, and now it's here for your enjoyment. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So we'll just continue with the next talk then. So we have lots of time today since the talk was canceled. We can all just relax. There you go. Very well. You have to know that this programming language is a kind of better calculator. Type 2 plus 3 into the terminal, Monty. Monty did so. Strange, nothing happens, she wondered. Yes, of course not. You still have to press the enter key, Python explained. Now a 5 appeared on the screen. Wow, great, Monty exclaimed. Can I calculate everything with it? Just try it, Python suggested. So now you might wonder what's going on here. So this was just a little excerpt from my book. So at the moment I'm working on an open source book project um, under a Creative Commons um, share alike license, yeah. And uh, this is joint work with Ingo Blackschmidt, uh, the Pearl fanboy from the talk before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, what's the idea? Um, I think programming is great fun and creative, so kids should really learn it. Yeah, and um, I'm writing this book um, so they can start programming early. So the target audience are, let's say, fifth or sixth grade children. Um, this is not just a non-fictional book, but instead it includes a funny fantasy story. And each chapter, of course, um, includes uh, lots of exercises. And at the end of the book, um, the aim is that uh, the kids should have uh, done an own little project, um, yeah, which is pretty cool. And they can show it to their friends. Yeah, then I can show you some uh, pictures I've drawn. So this is the heroine of the book. This is Monty. Um, she's just an ordinary little girl, and she loves math and logic and earthworms and also rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, she has a nice life, but then suddenly some aliens appear, yeah, and capture her because they are really in trouble. They had just one programming alien, which is, alien, which is lost, and now Monty has to fix all the trouble because their spaceship is broken, yeah. <laughs> so they really need her. And the third character in the book is, um, yeah, a stocking. <laughs> she calls herself Python, or Pi. Yeah, she believes that uh, she's a dangerous snake, which uh, in fact she's not. <laughs> and um, she's able to understand the spoken and written language of the aliens, which is pretty good. Then she can translate everything to Monty. Yeah, so these are the main characters. Of course, um, they have lots of adventures in the book. Um, Here's one example of an um, exercise of the book. It's just swapping values of variables. Um, this should teach the kids that you should choose proper names <laughs> for your variables, not here frog and duck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, wow, I'm quite good at time. Um, that's pretty much it. So um, the stuff is on GitHub. You can check it out. But uh, at the moment, uh, everything is just in German. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I thank you for your attention and uh, have a nice last day on this great conference. Yay. Thank you. So next up, modern security models for operating systems. This is a 16 to 9 talk video, people. <laughs> I think. It looks like it. No, it's not. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, I'd like to present you uh, a modern security model for operating systems. Um, as you can see, we use more and more uh, so-called smart devices. Uh, and we store more and more data on them. Uh, this data is sensitive, so it's rather obvious that we need to protect them. And in fact, uh, in mobile devices, uh, the data is somehow protected. But what about desktop systems? Uh, what's the difference between these two images? Uh, uh, the tricky part is that 
if we press install, uh, Ubuntu asks us for password, but in Android, for example, we need to accept a set of privileges the application would get uh, when operating. Uh, what's the real difference here? Uh, in the first uh, case, the desktop systems, uh, installed application is a full extension of uh, the user. Uh, it just works on behalf, uh, behalf of the user, so it can do everything user could do uh, by sitting on the terminal. And in the uh, case of uh, most of uh, mobile systems, uh, the application is somehow jailed or restrained to the privileges we uh, accepted it uh, to have. Uh, so uh, operating systems uh, to be useful have um, some resources, some services, uh, w which should be protected. Uh, in desktop systems, they're mostly not. In uh, mobile devices, they are. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the system which uh, provides access control on, on desktop systems. Uh, it consists, it's founded on three pillars. Uh, I don't have time to discuss all of them or their role in, th in this uh, framework, uh, but it consists of uh, DAC, uh, which are, is familiar to, to most of you, I think, uh, SMAC, which is one of LSMs, if maybe uh, Cell Linux rings more bells, then it's maybe not something similar, but analogous, and Cinara, the new policy checker in uh, user space. Uh, if you know Polkit or PolicyKit, it's something like that, but much faster and uh, much, uh, much better. Uh, so what's what's it's all about? Uh, you have a, a service in system, say it's network manager, and you have application which want to to manage uh, some features of this service, uh, and it connects b with some uh, IPC to this service, for example, Dbus or Unix socket, uh, and the service needs to know if this application has access to alter uh, the settings. Uh, for example, if it's uh, our dedicated uh, GUI to, to alter networking uh, in our system, then it's okay uh, for the service to listen to that application and alter the settings, but if it's some random application we, uh, we download from internet, probably it's not. Uh, how the service knows uh, that the access should be granted or not? Uh, it, ask, uh, it asks Cinara, uh, which is uh, basically a database with uh, policy on the current system, and Cinara answers the service if the access should be granted or not, so if the, uh, the altering should have effect or not. Uh, so, how Cinara knows the answers? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we can have uh, some sane defaults, built-in defaults in the system. Uh, we can have manifest, so if you know the concept of Android, uh, the application can come with uh, predefined uh, manifests uh, and um, manifest the, the, the uh, the accesses they would need, and privacy manager and administrator can alter the policy online. Uh, there are uh, these questions in the systems, as I said before. Uh, so what really, uh, happens is that the service, in this case, uh, for example, GPS, uh, knows who, who came and wants to, to know something or alter something, and it uh, sends the credentials of the application to to Cinera, uh, it queries Cinera, uh, and Cinera knows the answer as it is the database and can uh, return answer to the service, so service knows uh, if the access should be granted or not. Uh, that's all. If you have any questions, I will be around here. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. We'll continue with two other 16 to 9 talks. Okay. Next time I also state the file name and so on. Okay, okay that's it. Go ahead. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Yanai, and I've written another uh, pink tunnel. Uh, so let's start. Why did I actually do it? So it's working? Yeah. Okay. 
So ICMP tunnel. ICMP tunnel basically, uh, well, ICMP is a diagnostics protocol. You probably know it by ping to check if a remote host is up or not, what's the path to this uh, remote host. And this protocol is quite flexible. The pro you can put any payload on top of it, especially uh, you, can, you can even put uh, IP uh, data on it. And it, because it's used for diagnostics, it's usually very open, no one, well, some people close it, but many people keep it open for their use, so we can actually use it as a cover channel. And this idea is not new, it's been around for like 20 years or so, since FRAC in 96, but, and there has been many implementations, but I decided we need a new one, and I'm gonna tell you why. So I'm gonna talk about the previous implementations. The first one I thought I, you will probably see online is ICMPTX. It's very primitive, it doesn't have many features. It's mostly a reference implementation if you want to read like short code that explains how to do virtual interfaces stuff and ICMP low level, it's a great code, but you can't really use it in real life. The next one you'll find is Hans. Um, in case you don't know, this is like a futuristic BMW car. Uh, nobody fix it, but yeah. So, and it's very advanced. It has IP address assignment and many cool feature authentication, encryption, it's, you can set up MTU, it's written in C++, but it's too complicated in my opinion, and not, so, not very usable, and it does things that other tools does much better, like OpenVPN. So I didn't want to use it in real life, so I came up with my implementation. And my implementation aims for usability and, and uh, simplicity, okay? So there is no manual configuration of anything, you just run the one, the, the command and it works. You don't need to disable the ping replies on the server or stuff like that. You can just do it. There is name resolution so you can specify an address and not an IP, which no other tool has done. I don't know why. It's a very simple thing to do. We have congestion adjustments, which is very cool. If the server has lots of data to give to the client and the client is behind a net or a firewall, so the client picks it up and sends a, the request in higher rate, so the, the server now has greater bandwidth to send the data back. It also has a peer-to-peer -peer communication, uh, so if both client and server are on the same network, they both will just use the echo requests and not the replies, it will be faster. I didn't put any crypto because I think other tools should do it, like OpenVPN, and it's point-to-point -point only. The only cons I see right now is it only supports Linux. So um, the future, I'm gonna expand the support in other platforms. I'm going to contribute to an OpenWRT package in the coming month, I hope. And if anyone can help me port it to OS X or Android, that would be great. There is also another idea I've been thinking about to combine it with SoCut in one way, but I'm still thinking of it. So if you have any input, you can give me if it's a good idea, a bad idea, you think it's awesome, I would really like to hear from you. Uh, that's it. If you have questions, contributions, requests, talk to me. Uh, it's very easy to find me. I'm Yanai L on all the platforms. So thanks a lot. That's it. Thanks. Just stay there for a second. I think this is also yours. Yep. <laughs> Okay, hello, Re remember me? <laughs> so, it's me again. Um, my name is Yanai, same thing as, as previously. And I work for Checkpoint, and this talk is based on a post we're gonna put on our blog. So this is our blog, if anyone is interested, we have cool stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about how to do an ICMP tunnel with no root. So, in Linux, you need root to set up an ICMP tunnel, even as a client, you need to Actually, you needed to set up a virtual interface, you needed to do some routing, so your traffic will actually go through that interface, and you need to do some low-level ICMP read and write, which requires elevated privileges. So how can you overcome this idea? Because many people don't have root on their devices, namely Android is very common not to have root on, but you maybe still want to have an ICMP tunnel. So the routing and virtual interface is easy, we'll just use a SOX proxy, we'll forward the traffic through it, we can use it with library injection like TSOX does, or with uh, modern browsers, they have configuration for SOX proxy, so it's easy, and OpenVPN also has it. But uh, what about the ICMP? Well, that's, well, there is a solution, there is a one application that does ICMP requests on uh, traffic on behalf of any user, it's ping, 
And ping, it's really cool, but it's a suite, so you can't do hacks on it. Really, it's very protected. You need to just go with what the authors of ping thought when they wrote ping. So getting data out is easy. We have the minus p flag. You can specify a pattern, 16 bytes. Well, it's good enough. You can send data. That's quite easy. But what about incoming? So incoming data, well, I thought about a very elaborate scheme to send pings to the server. The server will delay the replies or drop them, and then the client will figure from this encoding what the original data was. But that's really, that's a problem. It's hassle to implement, and it's very inefficient. We'll get like bits per second. That's, that kind of sucks. So I kind of left this idea, and then I came, I debugged my tunnel, and I found this. So I don't know if you can see, but this, actually is a client sending a ping, normal ping to a server, and the server, instead of replying with the original payload, sends a different payload. And for some reason, the authors of ping thought it would be great if the client will just do hex dump of what the server sends. So if the server sends a wrong payload, ping says, okay, maybe I'm a hex dump now and I should dump the data from the server, cool. So, yeah. <laughs> So this is method two, basically. Just, uh, the client just send FFs. The server will reply with anything it wants, escaping the FFs. And ping will just print the hex dump. The client can just do the reverse hex dump and get the result, so that's cool. And this is my method. And I just, when I saw it, I wrote a quick demo of a reverse shell over this thing, like a reverse shell over ICMP, which requires no root. And I'm going to put this demo right now. It's a one-liner, but yeah, people will object. But can you put it up? Okay, and uh, if we don't have time, you can put it in double speed. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is this? Sorry? Okay, so what we see here on uh, my right is the client, on, on the left will be the server on, uh, on uh, Amazon. Are, is it running? No. It's, I think it stops, yeah. Okay, so now I'm connected to the server. I'm gonna download the server code from, uh, oh, from the internet. Blah, 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 blah. Oh. I should what, sorry? I'm not pressing anything. <laughs> you know, just hope the demo works. All right, so I'm pinging the server, and now I'm on the server, I'm gonna stop the automatic reply by the kernel, so now it stops, and the server does not reply anymore, and I'm gonna start running the server, uh, the ping server, so please start, yes. Okay, the server is running, now I'm gonna start the client. So the client does not, is a normal client, there are no privileges there. This is my one-liner, as you can see. <laughs> Yeah, and now there is a ping, lots of sad in the middle. There is an interactive bash, more sad, and then another ping. And now I'm running commands on the server, and they come from the client. If you can see, the server is running commands like, who am I? And it says, my user, not the root. So that's how it is. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Thank you. You can. Thanks. You can stop that. Now it's just running the, the normal commands on the server to see it was actually coming from the client, but that's about it. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Again, I was in I, and <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. So we are going back to an old school 4x3 uh, talk. Borg back up. So. Hi, uh, I want to show you a bit about Borg Backup. It's a rather new backup software. And some guy on Twitter said about a software, the holy grail of backup software. Well, you will check it on your own if you agree. My name is Thomas Waldmann, and the clicker is here. So uh, where did it come from? Uh, you m some of you maybe know Attic Backup. And Borg Backup is basically a fork of Attic Backup. Uh, Attic is about five years old, and it has a quite good uh, design internally from the software. It exists for quite a while, so it's not that new. But the problem a bit with Attic was the development was rather slow going because the main developer has no time. And um, 
he wants to do all on his own and so the pull requests on github piled up and it all was a bit slow and um, some people wanted to contribute including me and it, it didn't go on so a few months later we basically decided okay we fought the project so we can advance it and that's how Borg Backup came to life in May this year. And uh, the goals are to be faster paced, of course, and uh, to be also more inviting to the community so new developers can get in more easily and can get their pull requests accepted. So uh, what are the features? It's quite uh, an easy tool. You have an easy command line interface. You can also have a single file binary for some platforms, for Linux, for FreeBSD, for Mac OS X. Uh, so it's basically no installation, just copy the binary onto your system and you can do a restore. Uh, it supports different compression methods, for example, LZ4, it's a very fast compression. You can also have LZMA or Zlib, that's slower but uh, better compression. We do encryption and authentication. Uh, it's encrypt then Mac, so it's the recommended mode. Uh, and we use AES uh, in counter mode and HMAC SHA-256. Uh, we also have a few support, so you can do a backup and later mount the backup archive. So for example, you can use your file manager to just copy some single files out of it. Um, it's based on content-defined chunking and it does deduplication based on these chunks. Free and open software, platform support is quite good. Um, we support multiple architectures. It's not only x68, it's also on ARM and it maybe also runs on other platforms. You can have extended attributes and ACLs on your file system. It has support for hard links and basically everything you can think of. Uh, there's also quite good test coverage and we use a continuous integration system and everything is based on Python 3 and a little bit of Cython and C for better speed. But about 90% is in Python. Um, about a deduplication, it's quite nice because it works on the chunks. It's not on uh, complete file based uh, deduplication, but it's based on pieces of files. So you can uh, deduplicate your virtual machine images and if you start your virtual machine and stop it again and make another backup, it will only back up the few chunks in the virtual machine image that really changed. Also, if you rename a big directory, uh, it will still work with the deduplication because it's not based on the name. Uh, you can deduplicate between different machines if you just store them in the same repository. You have historical deduplication, so if only a little changed since last backup, it will only back up this. And also if there are duplicates within the same backup, they will also be covered. Um, maybe look this up on the internet, it's a bit too much for now but it's based on a rolling hash, so the computations it needs to do are quite efficient. Um, this is the most important URL. It's just on GitHub, Borg Backup. And well, if you have any questions, I'm here at the Python assembly. It's on the first floor, just take the stairs and then on the left. Um, yeah, or meet me on Twitter or on the IRC. And if you have anything, just use GitHub, make pull requests, make feedback. Thank you. Thanks. So we didn't really have to push anyone off the stage until now. Yeah, they, they, they do see, they can see the monitor, but they always forget. It's, I understand that, it's no problem. So, talking to the mic, don't forget that. The monitor is down there. Okay. Hallo. Ja, wir sind hier, um ein neues Produkt vorzustellen, was die Vorratsdatenspeicherung erst möglich gemacht hat. Es handelt sich um die Deutsche Bundespost. Äh, Bundespost war schon vergeben. Die schützt euren Internetverkehr vor Zugriff durch alle Behörden, äh, durch den Staat und so weiter. Die Deutsche Bundespost ist ein E-Mail-Datendienst.
Äh, was schützt sie? Sie schützt alle Inhaltsdaten und alle Verkehrs- und Metadaten. Äh, das ist natürlich wichtig, weil wir Menschen aufgrund von Metadaten töten. Also nicht direkt wir, sondern unsere Freunde. Und äh, das Geschenk von Heiko Maas an uns ist äh, die Regelung in der Vorratsdatenspeicherung, dass der gesamte E-Mail-Bereich komplett von der Speicherung ausgenommen ist. Äh, danke, Heiko. Ähm, wir wissen auch, dass, der Deutsche, äh, dass die Deutsche Bundespost Post nicht von dem BND gelesen werden kann, wenn ihr eine DE-E-Mail-Adresse dafür verwendet. Denn alle E-Mail-Adressen mit der Endung DE werden vom BND herausgefiltert. Wie funktioniert die Deutsche Bundespost? Die IP-Pakete werden über E-Mail ausgetauscht und die E-Mails werden über das unsichere, überwachte Netzwerk geschickt. Und wie das genau funktioniert, das sagt euch jetzt Zoll. Hey. Hi. <lacht> also, technisch ganz einfach. Wir, machen, wir nutzen das TUN-Device. Neben jedes IP-Paket, was da ankommt, packen das in E-Mail, versenden es über SMTP holen es über IMAP wieder ab, entpacken das IP-Paket, stecken es wieder in ein, in ein tun device und es ist wieder im Netzwerk-Stack. Funktioniert alles mit allem, was irgendwie mit IP kann. Es gibt nichts Neues unter der Sonne, auch IP over E-Mail nicht. Vor zehn Jahren wurde ein ITETF-Draft-Standard von Herrn Donald Eastlake geschrieben, wie man denn IP-Pakete in E-Mail in dem Fall MIME kodieren kann. Es gibt also Application slash MIME, äh, IP, um die Pakete einzupacken. Wir machen einfach Base64, packen ein paar Optionen hinzu, die uns sagen, von wo kamen die, die ähm, Pakete und welches IP-Format ist es. Zusätzlich können wir noch angeben, wie lange es denn normalerweise dauert und wie länger dann die IP-Pakete über E-Mail benötigen. Ja, higher is better. Also wir haben die tausendfache Sicherheit, <lacht> dauert auch tausendmal länger, aber auf sieben Sekunden kann man schon mal auf sein Ping warten. Ja, wir haben eine Implementierung, der Draft-Standard, um Richterstandard zu werden, braucht zwei, also wer möchte, kann hier einfach nochmal unser äh, meinem Standard nachimplementieren. Man kann sich hier auch bei Dovetail, das ist unsere Referenzimplementierung, mal ein paar Ideen holen, ist nur ein paar Zeilen Ruby-Code. Also bitte lasst euch nicht verarschen, ne? Netzpolitik.org hat mehr Informationen darüber, Coreboot verwenden, GnuPG verwenden, Tor und Tails verwenden, OTR verwenden und dann seid ihr vielleicht sicher. Danke. Okay, an introduction to Jekyll. Oh no, not again. So, Johannes Schöpp around. May the real Johannes Schöpp please stand up. <laughs> Last call. Um, this is actually a bit, um, yeah, it's not very nice if you register a talk and don't show up because other people would like to give a talk and I had to tell them it's all full. Mm. Yeah. You have to think of some punishments. <laughs> no, I think I'll just remove the slide now and we'll continue. I mean, we, we now have, um, we have a few minutes uh, left before the break, of course, and uh, we still have two talks. But if you're sitting here right now and think you have a PDF on your notebook that you can bring up here and want to talk about, then you can do that since we still have time. But right now we'll continue with the next two talks. There, there is one, I think. What? I don't understand you. You're too quiet. Uh -huh. Okay, then, uh, the, okay, okay, that's nice. So here's what we do. We, we just uh, take the next two talks now, and after that you can come up. Yeah. Put, put your PDF on an USB stick, and I can load it up. I don't have one. Okay, okay, we have one. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully you talk about something serious. <laughs> so let's continue with Void Linux. State of the Void the yearly state of the world talk. Morning. Um, hi, I'm Gertrux Enoboland and I'm talking about Void Linux. Uh, had anyone see of you, you guys uh, my last year's talks? One guy again. Um, it's, it was the one with the kitties. 
No kids this time. So um, please look at the monitor, not the slides. Okay. <laughs> nice slides. So uh, the history. Void Linux is a Linux distribution which was started in 2008 as a test bed for the um, for the package manager, which now XPPS as part of Void. Juan, which is a uh, uh, sp Spanish guy, is the founder and project, project leader. He started the project in 2008. Uh, yeah, what's, what's Void Linux? We are an uh, ordinary Linux distribution. We are a rolling release. Um, some things are quite different. We are using LibreSSL Libre instead of OpenSSL. We dropped, actually dropped uh, system D uh, one and a half years ago and replaced it. <laughs> replaced it with uh, run it. I still don't know how to pronounce, if, is it run it or is it R unit? I don't know. And we have our own, uh, our own uh, uh, package manager which, which is called XPPS. Um, XPPS is a package manager from the scratch. Uh, we are signing every package, which is which are uh, loaded from remote sources. If you have a local repository, you can also do uh, unsigned packages. And we have it's, a, it's an ordinary uh, it's an or ordinary uh, package manager. But we have still some cool tools like um, we can generate nice dependency graphs using. Um, um, dot formatter, which can be seen here. Uh, you can see here, Bash is quite low on its um, on its dependencies. Actually, fun fact: if you're uh, doing if you're doing a GNOME dependency graph, the PNG of the dependency graph is about 30 megabytes big in PNG. I have no time. What's what Linux for devs? We are completely managed on GitHub. We have a um, we have a uh, continuous integration based on BuildBot. So if any packages get updated on GitHub, they are going to our continuous integration, and they are automatically, if they build, in our um, in our repositories. Now, why use what Linux? We are very fast in development. You will see this, this in the next slides. Uh, we have quick updates, and it's very easy to get involved uh, due to our uh, GitHub-based development. The last year, there was one active user in the audience. How many Void Linux users are here? Oh, great. I think we degraded about 100%. percent. There's, there's still one. Are you the same, same guy as last, last year? Ah, OK. So we have at least two active uh, white Linux now. <laughs> Which is great, about 100% in one year. Yeah. Um, and other OSs, Arch Linux. OK, some more, DB and Ubuntu, some more, Mac. Nice. OK. The last year, uh, this is our. This is the last year of our package uh, package uh, system, uh, the void packages. So we have got uh, 15,000 updates in the last year, which uh, are about uh, 40 commits per day. Don't get me on this. Um, we have about uh, 6,200 packages in. Uh, uh, Global and we are uh, doing. Yeah, you, you can see, see the numbers. It's just this. this. Ah, time's up. Conclusion: We are the new cut in, in the, in the um, on the blog, and we have two active uh, people which are using this stuff. Quite some fun fact: um, quite some more people were at, at our assembly. We are still at the assembly at the hall three. If you want to come and drink a mate or, or whatever, just just uh, join in. A uh, lot of stuff happened last year. I, I just showed show, show that. And thank you. We have no time for, for questions. This, this is the URL. We have a Twitter account, and this is my private Twitter account. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. So we still have one talk, and then, yeah. No, no problem. But stay, stay in front of, stay, stay here because you have to get up quickly. So this is going to be a 16 to 9 talk again.
Hey everyone, uh, my name is Rezvan. You may call me Bobby because it's much simpler. Today I'm going to present you Android Intern Fuzzy module for Drowser, or you may call it Fuzzy Noser because it's simpler. Um, a little bit of introduction. Uh, basically, um, we want to build, we have built actually an, Android, an, an open source project where um, we fuzz intents. Intents are used for Android to communicate between activities, to announce some events, stuff like that. And uh, an intent has several parameters, like six parameters. And uh, in the first phase, we collect information about our system. We target either one package or the whole uh, system, Android uh, system. Then we uh, create the fast uh, intents and then we send it to the system. Then we collect uh, the responses. We, we see how uh, applications handle those malformed intents, so to say. Um, for those who are not familiar with Drowser, Drowser is an open source framework for testing Android security. Uh, basically, you have a server running on your Linux machine and the client. It's called a Drowser agent. You install it on uh, an Android phone or a device, actually. Uh, it communicates with your server through an Android debug port um, 31415 by default. And uh, then you have this console where you can uh, list uh, all the modules, help, co uh, help any module or run every co any comment, any module. Uh, what does our fuzzy noser um, at this point uh, is able to send broadcast intents, fuzzed intents. It can s uh, save a seed file, which is actually a trace of all the intents which have been run until a crash occurred. And if a crash occurred, you have a log file saved, and also the state, just not to uh, must uh, rerun the whole thing from the beginning, but uh, from the crash point onwards. Um, a cool uh, feature also is this denial of service attack. We have been performed against Activity Manager using our project. Uh, this is how it looks like. Basically, you run the name of the module, in our case, Intense Fuzzy Noser, and then uh, passing some, uh, some parameters. Running help, you can see what kind of parameters it accepts and which kind of values. Um, regarding the results, we get a lot of um, exceptions so far, like uh, Java exceptions, uh, illegal exceptions, and security exceptions. And of course, this uh, denial of service attack against the activity manager. Can we have the short movie? You want to show your demo movie? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can uh, play it for from the middle or something. I'll try. Uh, yeah. Okay. Full screen and. Yeah. Can can we play it from from the middle uh, just to skip like two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. So uh, this is Drowser in the left. This is the agent. And this is our module. And basically, um, we are using um, uh, intense.fuzzynoser uh, minus minus dos, dos uh, command. Uh, we can skip like 20 seconds or so. <laughs> We are running against this uh, com.android uh, Bluetooth package. Yeah, please, please keep uh, like until. Yeah, you, you can skip it until here. Yeah, so this is the command. And uh, you will see the result in a second. Basically, if you try to open any other application, it will shut down automatically. Yeah, and it does it for, for the whole, for any application. Um, this is uh, happening only during this denial of service attack. Um, thank you. We can come back to the presentation. I have just one more slide. And um, 
here is our account. It's fuzzing on GitHub. You can reach us. Uh, we have several projects there. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, please come and contribute with your feedback, opinions, anything. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. OK. Um, uh, you have a clicker on the, on the podium. I just have to look for your talk here. Fuzzing PDF. Yeah. So Another I will also talk. talk about fuzzing, um, but on Linux. So yeah. Wait a second. I have to determine the uh, aspect ratio right now. Ah, it's four by three. So video people, it's four by three. <laughs> Let's go. Hello, um, I'm Hanno, and I run the fuzzing project, which is uh, yeah, I try to fuzz free software and improve security and. Uh, remove bugs from free software packages. Um, fuzzing is basically, can be explained as you throw garbage at software. So what you do is you use some input and then you add errors to the input and then you see if something bad happens. And something bad could be a crash, but also could be other things like everything that indicates that there's some bug. Um, there's a tool called American Fuzzy Lob, which has now been available for like uh, two years, I think. and. Uh, it really kind of redefined what good fuzzing is because uh, it uses a very intelligent algorithm that it observes code paths in an application and if it finds a new code path, it feeds that input that generated that code path back into the fuzzer and uses that as a further sample for fuzzing. Um, that's how it looks. So it has a very nice uh, ASCII interface. Um, uh, most of the stuff is not that important. The most important thing is the red number you see, which is the number of crashes it found in some application. Um, this is a kind of maybe unusual example for a bug that I discovered with American Fuzzy Lob. Um, here you see a, a relatively simple calculation. So we have some number that is squared and, it's, uh, uh, and then a modular operation with a very large number. And uh, you can see two results. And I would like to ask who thinks the first result is the correct one? Not that many. Who thinks the second is the correct one? OK, so most don't have an opinion on it. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, the first is the correct one. And that can be easily seen because a squaring roughly, uh, if you square something, it's roughly twice the size of the result. Um, the second result is the result from OpenSSL. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's been fixed now. Uh, last security update fixed that. Um, uh, that's the, where the bug was introduced. Um, I have no idea what it does. It's, um, it's an assembly optimization of the algorithm, and yeah, somehow a bug slipped in there. Um, then um, here's a very simple example of um, a stack out of bounds read. I hope you all see that this code is wrong because we're reading um, an array out uh, on an index that doesn't exist. Um, these kinds of bugs uh, are a bit tricky to find because usually when you run this code, it will just run and read something out of the memory, but it will not crash. So the application will still run. It may do something wrong. It may have some malfunction. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's kind of a bit tricky to find these bugs. But there's uh, another great tool, which is called Address Sanitizer. And it's a feature of the compiler. And if you compile an application with Address Sanitizer, then these kinds of bugs will give you these kinds of error messages. Um, yeah, which is nice. And uh, if you're using fuzzing in combination with address sanitizer, then you find much more bugs. Uh, but also, uh, you can just use this for testing your application. And I'm still seeing applications that if you just compile them with address sanitizer, they will show just by running them some invalid memory reads. And that really shouldn't happen. So if you're developing any kind of software in C, uh, then try address sanitizer, test your software with it, and uh, yeah, if it shows you bugs, then please fix them. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, if you want to hear a longer version of that talk and are in Berlin on the 5th of January, I 
will do a longer talk on the fuzzing project in the Afra hackerspace. And I also did a talk yesterday, but yeah, you missed that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for jumping in on such so short notice. U ultra lightning blitz flash talk. <laughs> so uh, then we will start with a break right now. So we'll meet again at 2 o'clock in this room for the next part of the lightning talk session. Hanno, I think you want your you flash drive back, right? <laughs>
Okay, I think we, uh, I think we can start with the next uh, part of the lightning talk sessions. Please have a seat, close the doors. And somehow you see I'm over here because uh, the fail overflow crew somehow, yeah, they took over our stage and they are going to present a short uh, hardware hacking demo. It should speak for itself. That's it. Thanks a lot.
So now we have to set everything back up again. <laughs> These guys are really fast. I mean, when they came up here on the stage, I, I thought, geez. So that's it. I should probably get my Get my slides back again now. <coughs> so then we're going to continue with the regular uh, lightning talks now. IPFS is the next one. All right, so uh, IPFS, who here has heard of IPFS before? Oh, that's pretty great. So, um, oh, is that uh, okay? Uh, just a minute, we, we uh, cannot show you uh, brand new things uh, just on the screen. So either you step back for one talk, we have a chance to review you, your PDFs, okay, no or worries. you take the old ones. Sure. Um, they, they are the guys that oh, just gave me. This is the USB stick I'm supposed yeah. to plug in here. Ah. No. Now I get it. I mean, all the. All the trouble here. Yeah. Ah. You're killing me. Okay, IPFS update. Looks much better. <laughs> ah, that's better. <laughs> okay, cool. These are the slides I actually am more comfortable with. All right, so IPFS is a protocol to upgrade the web. What does it stand for? Uh, interplanetary file system. It's kind of a mixture of torrents and Git and the web and a bunch of things that have existed for a while, but we're putting them all together and making them great. So the web today is this big, giant cluster of weird things connected all over the place, and it's you know like a giant hive consciousness. And it's really great. It's really awesome. It enables you know what we have today. You have all of these different services for people to do everything they need to get along with their lives, and it's awesome. But they're mostly centralized. You know, if your connection to the backbone goes down, if the server goes down, if things break, it's very fragile. You lose access to all the things you rely on. And um, so, the, like, the web right now is very centralized. You know, some aspects are decentralized. But what we really would love is for a fully distributed web where there's no single point of failure, no single point of attack for, you know, bringing down infrastructure. So IPFS is a protocol to upgrade the web. You have, the, we call it the distributed web or the permanent web or the Merkle web, you know, for Merkle tree hashing. Um, it's offline, or it can be offline. It's smarter, it's distributed, <laughs> um, permanent, safer, and faster. Uh, oh, that's going wrong. So today we use location addressing. If I want to access a, you know, page, I give my browser the location of the page. I say it's google.com, which resolves to an IP address, and then I go to talk to that machine, and I get the things from it, right? So example.com goes to this, and then I follow the path down from there. Uh, that's, you know, that's centralized, it's broken. What we do is we take and we map to content location. So we really don't care where things are, we just care what they are. Um, the way we do that is content addressing, which is similar to how Git works. So today, or, yeah, so right now you would go and request, you know, to a given server, I want this thing. And you have to go all the way to that server, no matter who else in the world has it, you go to them. And you get it from them. And with IPFS, you can request the file from anybody who has it, no matter where they are, anywhere on the internet, anywhere in the world. Or if they're right next to you, or if they're in Antarctica, you can get it from them without really much extra effort, or without any extra effort. Um, so the IPFS stack is really three parts. You have a peer-to-peer -peer networking layer where you have, you know, networking, you have basic transport, TCP, reliable, or reliable UDP. You have a routing layer, which, you know, is uh, our, for us a distributed hash table. And then on top of that, you have data formats, so you can format your data in different ways to make it easy to transport around the world and you know, transport around the web. And you have a naming layer, um, which allows you to have mutability over kind of a static web which is, you know, kind of required. And then on top of all that, you build applications, which is the fun part. 
then that stack looks like this, where we have all these different options at every given layer, you know, all these options for networking. You could use CJNS, WR WebRTC, Quick. You could have, you know, we use accidentally DHT for routing, but you can use many different things, you know. Um, the exchange can be BitTorrent, it could be our bit swap, it could be straight up HTTP just as an exchange. And in the middle, everything is a Merkle DAG data structure. And that builds on top of all of that. And then above that, you have, you know, we can implement our own DNS type thing, we have IPNS, you have Namecoin you can use for naming, and then you build applications on top of that. Um, the IPFS project itself is very open. We, you know, open source, everything is out there. Um, we have lots of contributors. As this is actually, you know, a cool little graphic we have of all the people who have helped out and contributed to IPFS. It's exciting to see that many faces on the thing. Um, we have all these applications that people have built so far and many more. This is just a small list that we pulled together for this presentation. Um, lots of really cool stuff. And if you, there's this, that's where that list is from. And, oh crap, go back. And if you want to learn more, there is a session at uh, 1425 and Hall 13. It's kind of a small group session. But yeah, that's I think all the time I have, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So um, you probably want your USB flash drive back. Um, just come afterwards <laughs> by my laptop here. <coughs> R open source and the right side of the brain. No, this is not the one. The oh, that's it, yeah. Yes, it is. So uh, we're going to spend a little bit time talking about free and open source software and the right side of the brain, and in particular, how people with right brain competencies can interact with programmers and developers. What do I mean exactly by right brain competencies? Could be a designer, could be a usability expert. Uh, these are probably the two competencies we'll speak the most about. It could also be a musician, a writer, uh, somebody who plans a media campaign. Any of the skills that you need to launch a mass movement, any of the skills you need for persuasion to work, most of the things we think of as a whole lot of fun. Um, and they are different than the skills necessary for programming, but they interlink in all sorts of interesting ways. Okay, so forward. Images are powerful. I wrote a piece a while ago basically talking about how there's an analogy to precompiled code. Uh, I'll show you an example of what I mean. The brain processes image very differently than it processes written language. Which do you notice first? on this slide. If you're like me, you probably notice the images. The text, the words take longer to go through. Um, it's, it's a different, it's a much older processing system. Written language is a very new technology, only dates back about 5,000, 6,000 years. Um, we as a species, we as organisms have been processing visual data and reacting to it for many millions of years, uh, and as a result, it acts on us differently. It acts on our emotions. It acts on a very gut level, uh, which uh, is powerful, can be dangerous, can also be something really useful if you're trying to create software that changes the world. So uh, I come to this with a few core assumptions. Usability and design have value. Many open source applications, not all, because there's plenty of crappy software all over the place to be found, uh, but many lag behind commercial software in terms of usability. Uh, design and usability are specialized skill. I just went to a wonderful lecture teaching programmers the basics of good, good UI, good UX. If you have the ability to bring in a trained designer or UX professional on your open source project, I would really advocate that you go that, that route because it is, it's, it's, a different, it's a different brain set, it's a different set of skills. Uh, and my assumption is that people want their projects to be the best and would like better skills. Two, there are a lot of cultural differences, but there also are a lot of cultural similarities. 
there are a lot of barriers to be overcome, one of which is that repositories from GitHub on, on out are not really set up to measure or track the contributions of anything other than, than code commits. And there's a great tool called Resource Space that provides a way around that, uh, but it, it's not really integrated into anything. You know, I, I would hope that some of these features may be better supported in the future. Uh, different creative cultures. Uh, I think the biggest shift really uh, has to be finding ways uh, for designers and programmers to come together and just getting stories of success out there. Two examples, lightning fast before we close. Signal, hugely influential. This is an app that lets you have encrypted conversations on your phone. I installed it in a matter of minutes. It was effortless. It's gotten rave reviews. Uh, it's available for iOS, Android, now for desktop also. Get it if you don't have it already. Um, hugely praised and influential in the encryption community. And if you look at their credits, um, you're, you have a designer at the very top. If me, this is a much smaller project. I'm about to go over, so I'll stop now and just say, what you want to concentrate on is finding a designer and learning to speak the same language. Um, you can contact me at artmeetsco.org if you're interested in more information. Thank you. Thank you. So I have to close a few windows. So next one is find, find it. Yeah, hi, my name is Georg. I want to tell you about Find Find It. It was previously named Search Hilo, in case you heard about that already. And what is it? It's a manual meta search engine. So it means you can use it via a website or a browser extension or an Android app. And all of them give you an input field. And in that input field, you can type in search queries using shortcuts. So let's see some examples. If you type in DB Berlin, Hamburg, you get redirected to the uh, German Railways website showing you the next train from Berlin to Hamburg. If you type in tell Maya, DD, you get redirected to the German phone book. Uh, you see people uh, living in Dresden named Maya and their phone numbers. If you type in PHP string length, you get redirected to the PHP documentation of that very function. So what's the magic behind it? No big magic, actually. There is a parser taking the query apart. So we, from tell Maya, DD, we know keyword equals tell, argument count equals two. We make a, do a database lookup, we get a URL. That URL has placeholders. We fill in the search arguments into the placeholders. Some placeholders are special, like ORT in this case. So ORT is of type city. So uh, for cities, we have a mapping table for every country. In that case, the input DD gets replaced with Dresden, and then Dresden goes into the URL, and this URL gets redirected. So actually, it's not a whole story, because sometimes we have some um, clashes. Um, we have the same keyword and many possible targets. For instance, if we type in FR bonjour, we want a French dictionary. But which one? French German, French English, French Swedish. Or if you type in W Berlin, we want a Wikipedia article of Berlin, but the German Wikipedia, English Wikipedia. Or A goes for Amazon, but which Amazon? British Amazon, US Amazon, and so on. Solution is namespaces. Um, so we, as the users, say, OK, we speak German. We live in Germany, so we want shortcuts having with, uh, coming from these languages and, and this country. And then all the shortcuts are, have also their namespace, and they get prioritized uh, according to our setting. Mm. Registered users get their own namespaces. So you can, if you register, you can set up all your, your keywords in your namespace. And even other users can follow your namespace. So a use case for that could be you're at a company, you set up some shortcuts for the company's wiki, and then your colleagues can follow your namespace and can benefit from your constant maintenance of it, these shortcuts. Shortcuts are revisioned, and they're editable like in a wiki. So it's like Wikipedia. We can revert and uh, go back. Uh, and there's also an autocomplete. So there are certainly 5,000 shortcuts. You don't need to remember all of them. You can just search while, um, while typing. And all these, the, the search goes all, uh, not only over the keywords, but also over the possible titles. So this is all the possible comma, uh, shortcuts, starting with Deutsche Bahn. 
And there's also an API. So in case you say, I don't want to give all my search, quer search queries to a foreign server, you can build your own parser. You can ask the API and just send, OK, keyword equals tell, argument count equals two. Give me the URL template, and then you can um, get this JSON and fill in the URL, your search arguments um, by yourself. Mm. And yeah, it's uh, free software and free data. So there's uh, shortcuts are licensed uh, on the Creative Commons. The code is uh, licensed on the Afero GPL. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, findfind underscore IT. And um, most next goal is I want to have built more uh, mobile apps. So if you're good at uh, creating uh, native uh, um, mobile apps, then yeah, feel free to contact me. OK, thanks. Thank you. Next up, hack basis and hacker nomadism. <coughs> Hi, Congress. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, hack basis and hacker nomadism. Uh, hack bases are living hacker spaces, so. You know, there's this design pattern that hackers shouldn't actually sleep in hacker spaces. That's probably a good idea if the space isn't designed for that. But if you've got like a separate space or if it's a camp or something, then it might actually work. So I decided to kind of investigate that in uh, Canary Islands, Lanzarote. And, uh, and the, the other part to, to my talk is hacker nomadism, which would be kind of like the idea that if you have several hack bases, then we could possibly maybe move around um, them, you know, kind of to form a kind of a new lifestyle. Um, so the hack base is, um, that's where it is. You see that's like the Saharan Desert. Um, the Canary Islands are a Spanish, uh, um, still running Spanish colony. There's uh, about 100 volcanoes in the place. It looks like Mars or Moon or something. And it's uh, really awesome to live in hack there. Um, it's like a long description of what kind of goes on there. The, if, you, if you look at kind of the bottom part, you know, it's this kind of self-sustainability, resilience, um, but also critical theory, temporary architecture, and energy systems, and so forth, because um, the whole idea is really to go to, to, to build everything ground up. And, uh, and right, so. <laughs> Uh, these are some of uh, the recent pictures for the project. For three years, it was a normal house, but then the house kind of got too small. There was like 17 people at one time in a <laughs> running around before, uh, before Christmas uh, in a house that had kind of like one or two bedrooms. So that was, uh, that was kind of um, crazy. So we decided, to, okay, let's try to rather than spend money on rent, um, buy land in the desert and just start building it there. And these are some of our first experiments this year. Um, okay, that will be general about um, the hackbase project. Um, so about hacker nomadism, right? Then if you're in the hackbase for two, three, four months, then you're like, okay, what, or, or Congress is ending, you might ask yourself, what do you want to do next in my life, right? And um, the totalism.org slash calendar is, uh, attempted a systematic um, overview of everything, everything that's going on um, in the European hacker scene. Um, this is just like a short list of uh, events. Of course, as all sites on, on this uh, <coughs> page, it's openly editable. So you can freely, you are invited, kindly invited to freely participate. Um, as you see, there's actually quite a lot of going on. And uh, the intention of my talk is to, to um, encourage you to, you know, to go to more of this um, event and uh, you know leave some of this Congress feeling also in the middle of the year. Um, the other, the second systematic part is a collection of maps. So I've been moving around a lot for the last four or five years. I've basically been living like this, and uh, I've compiled kind of like pretty conclusive maps of uh, these different cities I've lived in for at least like two months or so. Um, that's Berlin. Sorry, it's on Google Maps. <laughs> really, like, um, it's gonna, it's, um, I'm going to set up the open street maps, but it was really the easiest thing to just start with this. So um, it's going to be ported soon. Um, yeah. 
Um, that's the hackerspaces.org definition of hackbases. Um, and um, there's actually several ones, right? So cyber hippie totalism is the long official name for the one I'm running. Um, there's two in India. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's Calafau in Barcelona and so on. So there's really a bunch of these spaces already running. Um, you're really invited to check them out, um, send emails, you know, and um, so on. And this is the third and final systematic investigation I'm hosting on the site. It's, um, you know, it's not only about hack bases, right? I mean, um, if, you listen, if you look at the talk yesterday, I mean, um, um, what was it, 10 years after we, we lost the war, it was really, um, there was a, a very positive, I think, encouragement to, um, to work with others, right? So to acquire these topics, I, I've also like looked at, you know, different spaces and they're listed here. Um, this is the poster and uh, that's our plans for this season. We want to buy land and everything else and uh, live with lizards and heck, that's it, thanks. Thanks a lot. So next talk, impact, if you remember that from, uh, from the first session, this is going to be canceled due to reasons. Um, are the Wikidata people around already? Okay, then we'll continue with that right away. Oh, it's got a nice cat. This is bright. All right, so Wikidata isn't machine readable, and uh, that kind of sucks. Um, don't you wish that your bot or um, whatever website you are creating could make use of the information on Wikipedia easily. So um, about three years ago, Wikidata went live. Wikidata is also run by the Wikimedia Foundation, just like Wikipedia. It's, um, well, it's kind of the, I like to call it the encyclopedia by bots, for bots, but officially it's the knowledge base anyone can edit. Um, yeah, both is obviously true. It's actually, the, the idea is basically have something like Wikipedia for structured data um, and make it possible to use this, well, you, you probably know info boxes on Wikipedia, right? And they kind of look different on different language versions and sometimes they also have more information in one language or they have different information in uh, different languages. And if you have ever looked at the source of this page, the wiki text. This is all kind of maintained as um, rather complex template transclusions and parameters, and it's nasty to parse, especially if you deal with different language versions or very different uh, kinds of information like the sun and sports and, I don't know, chemical elements and so on. Um, so the idea behind Wikidata is to maintain all this information in a central place and make it possible to use that, well, obviously in different Wikipedia articles, but also wherever you like. And one very important bit with that is people don't always agree, right? Uh, sometimes the question, even, even a seemingly qu simple question like how large is a country is a really political question, right? Because people don't agree on borders. So Wikidata doesn't collect facts, it collects statements. It says, it just collects who said what about what, when and where, right? So um, that makes the data model a bit more complex. Uh, it gives you, and it makes it a little, a little harder to query, but it gives you a lot more of depth of information. It doesn't, doesn't just tell you, okay, that's the number of people in a city, it tells you when and how it was, uh, how that number was figured out and where the source is. So uh, you actually can have a lot of different um, statements about the same, the same topic. Now, um, we also give you a way to query this. Um, there's a Sparkle endpoint, which is very powerful. So very simple thing would be listing all books by Hemingway. Um, but you could also do more, uh, well, that kind of list you can basically find anywhere, but uh, do you want to know the most common causes of de death of US presidents? 
or something similar, you can just ask for it. Um, if you can figure out the Sparkle syntax. I'm still struggling with Sparkle, so if there are any experts here, I'm very happy to, to learn. There is also a um, much more simple JSON-based API, uh, but in that case, you already have to know what you want, it, uh, what you are looking for. So basically, if you already have the ID of this thing you want information about, you can use a simpler API. Um, that's, for instance, useful if you want to have um, the name of a thing in 50 different languages. Uh, we can give you that, right? So um, this afternoon, there at uh, at 4 p.m. in Hall 13, um, there will be a workshop uh, where I will give some more in-depth information about this, and hopefully there will be a time and opportunity to experiment a bit, and um, there will be time to discuss the data model and maybe different um, applications of this. So, right. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next talk is going to be genesis.re in widescreen. Ah, there you are. One, two, three, one, two, three. Thank you very much. Uh, the project I am presenting is called uh, genesis.re. Many people uh, ask, the .re uh, domain extension. This is actually French territory reunion on the Indian Ocean in near Madagascar. Next slide. Uh, you can advance the slides yourself. There's a clicker device. Yeah. <laughs> when I see all the work completed at the camp, at the Congress, I realized that much of the work is, is wasted. We put so much effort into setting up infrastructure, uh, borrowing stuff, putting up systems in place, four days of Congress, and then it is uh, gone. We need to clean up, we need to tear down. I would like to uh, establish a permanent uh, base, permanent uh, habitat, so we could preserve this lifestyle all day, every day. Currently, it is not sustainable because we don't have enough sleep, we don't have enough nutrition. We know that this is only four days, so we push our bodies to the limits. But if we approach it in a systematic way, we have the food hacking area, we have a sleep hacking area, we have a agriculture hacking area, uh, so this is the big thing, creating establishment. Whoops. Uh -huh. uh, this is a Google search for uh, Spain city for sale. Many places in Spain and Portugal are left abandoned because people from the farmers are migrating to cities and the whole city is abandoned. Uh, this is one of the articles. 50,000 pounds, it can get you a, a garage in London. London is so expensive. However, this amount of money can buy a whole city. Uh, this is me. This is my last day in the office. I was working as an IT contractor and I was earning too much money. The, the, seriously, I was earning too much money in my job, so I thought I need to quit it and go 10x. The amount of money that is in the system is just enormous, and I believe that money is actually for free. Uh, these are the, some personal loans at 3.5%. It is next to nothing. So right now I'm just putting systems and policies and procedures so I can accept infinite amounts of money. As an individual, if I receive 200,000 euros, that would be money laundering, counter-terrorism, so basically, opening businesses, opening structures, putting this all together, and one of my mentors says, business and entrepreneurship are the fastest vehicles of change. <laughs> I will give you some time to read the quote of the 
Andy Warhol, good business is the best art. And in principle, I believe that by creating the village, the ecosystem, the chaos town, we can learn how to grow food in, in Syria. We can do the hydroponics, we can do uh, water reclamation, we can do clean energy. So this is my way and contribution to actually save the planet. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about Syria. For instance, it is caused by climate changes. There is a term on Wikipedia, environmental refugees, and they estimate 250 million refugees globally. So this is, this is it, genesis.re. Genesis means source, origin, beginning. This is the first chapter of the Bible, and whether we like it or not, Bible has a strong influence on the Western culture. And uh, I really want to create something new by the whole city and have the chaos lifestyle all day, every day, in a sustainable manner. Thanks a lot. Encrypted walkie-talkie, coming up. Hello, everyone. Um, I will present the project we have in common with uh, five people. Uh, we are not a startup. We do this because we think it's necessary, and we do it with our own means. Um, so we wish to develop encrypted walkie-talkies. Uh, there are two lines that direct our work. Um, first, to create a device in the least complicated manner based on open source software and hardware. Um, that being the exact opposite of today's mobile phones before you say just encrypt your phone. Secondly, we wish to use strong, reliable and known encrypting so that users can trust it. Um, what is the interest or purpose of such a device? Basically, we want to make it possible for numerous people to communicate in real time in a secure manner. Another major interest of walkie-talkies is to communicate without using infrastructures, external infrastructures, such as mobile phone relays and antennas that we do not control. Also, we try to build walkie-talkies that don't transmit acknowledgements when receiving so that they are not subject to geolocation, at least for the ones receiving. Uh, last but not least, designing this is interesting because there isn't such a device available on the pu public market for civil society. Um, what does our project look like? In order to use a strong crypto, we had to turn towards digital walkie-talkies. Um, the devices will be pushed to talk. We want it to be possible for numerous people to communicate at the same time as with analog walkie-talkies. Therefore, the devices will communicate over channels so that everyone on the same channel uh, can transmit and receive. We also considered integrating a text messaging function with a similar protocol to pages, but we haven't yet studied that part. Um, we chose not to use ZRTP or asymmetric encryption. Why? Because ZRTP is based on Diffie-Hellman and only enables two people to communicate at the same time and therefore doesn't match our goals. As for asymmetrical encryption, it would require long and complex procedure of exchange of keys. We judge that impractical for walkie-talkies that are mainly tactical objects. Um, here is the general model that is the base of our prototypes. Uh, three things to pay attention to here. Uh, for the digital encryption of the voice, we use Codec 2. Uh, this is an encoder with a low bit rate and is open source. Um, secondly, the data is encrypted and authenticated with SHA-SHA-20 and Poly 1305 from DJ Bernstein, and an RFC exists for this. As for the radio transmission, the digital signal is modulated uh, in GMSK, but we may actually use something else but similar to that. Um, the diagram is identical for transmission and reception, and uh, we have no time to detail the protocol and management of the nonce of Shasha 20. So, 
um, we have created a functional prototype that is here. <laughs> uh, uh, prototype, um, this functional prototype is using prototype STM cards that are themselves using ARM uh, Cortex M4 sound card and digital microphone. Uh, we use a transceiver for the GMSK modulation and demodulation. Uh, for our test, we have made uh, D-pole antennas that look like this. Um, so far, it works without amplification and with a power of 200 milliwatts. Uh, in town, the prototypes have a scope of 800 meters, and a lot of work remains specifically concerning signal amplification, not to go into details. Um, so concerning applications, uh, why encrypt phones, emails, and not everything? Uh, as for the rest, I think you can let your imagination run. And so just to show you, I think someone wants to say something to us in an encrypted prototype walkie-talkie. <laughs> okay, a little sound connection problem. And so, um, you can uh, like email us or just uh, catch us at the end of this if anyone has knowledge or wishes to work on that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now we are continuing with the annual Food Hacking Base report. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, my name is František Algodor Apfelbeck, and I am representing what we have done and what we didn't this year with the Furikin Base and many other people. Now, I will start with the camp because it was our main event this year, 2015. Uh, many of you, I hope, were there and enjoyed. We have run, uh, again, a hub for people to come and play with the food, the drinks, and bio. Uh, our group basically gets resources uh, through crowdsourcing campaigns and through our donations, establish workshop venues, experimental kitchens, put some structure in, like basic workshop for cheese tasting or beer brewing, extraction of DNA from kiwis, and after we invite people to fill it up the rest of the slots, most of them with their activities. So basically, you don't have to belong to us, you just have to show up talk to us and do what you like. We are basically environment for people who are in the food, drink, and bill, believing uh, that hacking can be applied, as we do, and joining us. So we had a camp, we had a great time. Uh, we got resources to do what we liked. Uh, many events were happening. I hope that you can check some of them and join us in the future. Uh, after the camp, we had a tour again. We did already a few. So we are touring Europe, basically going to Paris. Uh, we have been in Balkon, a very interesting uh, congress in Serbia, in Novi Sad. We have met um, MRMCD in uh, Darmstadt and many other places, promoting our activities and basically talking to the people, improving the places where people can play with the drinks, food, and taking it farther. The tour was great and we really enjoyed it. Now, uh, 32C3 was not as easy and uh, not as, uh, I would say, fruitful as in the years, uh, in the past years. Uh, we have been prohibited to do our food, drink, and beer activities uh, in the Congress Center. We deeply disagree with that, and uh, we would like to change this in the future. For that, we need to communicate uh, with you, uh, with the Orga, and find the ways how we can do what we believe is supposed to be here and do it in a manner which doesn't endanger the Congress, of course, but also allows people to do new ways, uh, develop a new uh, horizons, I would say, in these uh, fields here in the hacker community, hacker event. Now, uh, we have been running the for independently. We had a small assembly here, which was designed and dedicated to our hacking of our experimental incubator, playing with recipes and so on. Uh, however, our main activities were happening around two kilometers away in the Centro Sociale, which I would like to thank for their hospitality. Uh, we managed to get enough resources to get a place set up. Uh, we have to pay the rent, of course, and we had invited people again, open doors, everybody's welcome, 
donation based, no one turned away for the lack of funds. Uh, people came, they have found us, which we were very happy. We ended up in the plus numbers, which is very important for us. And uh, even people who didn't have a ticket for the Congress, of course, were welcome. So we tried to open doors ex as much as possible as usually. We did beer brewing workshops, we had uh, different activities from, uh, let's say, you know, uh, hosting the uh, Amuela Tomat, which you could see, you know, here in the Hacker Center, uh, Hackers uh, CCH. Unfortunately, also was uh, asked to leave later on. And we have been doing the cheese taste things uh, and many other events. You can check our wikis uh, when they are up, of course, the Congress wikis. Uh, for the 2016, we have, of course, plans. Uh, uh, in my case, I would like to come back to the Europe and start a uh, food hacking base in situ. Uh, we will be looking for a place where to do so. So I'm now considering Germany, Czech, you will see. Uh, we will participate in 33C3. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, we really hope that it will be in the Congress Center and we will do our best on our side to manage and help to make it happen. We deeply respect the Orga of CCC through the years of cooperation. So we really hope that we will be able to find a way. If we don't, uh, we will go independent again, maybe with others, we will see. Uh, and we will do what we like, and again, we will open the doors and invite people to do what uh, is kind of common for us and what is uniting us. So, uh, I would like to thank everyone for your time. I would like to thank the Centro Sociale for hosting us, and of course, you know, to this great event which was organized and was very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. From chemical plant protection to digital plant protection. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Walter. I'm a beekeeper that is volunteering his time in a number of uh, beekeeping organizations. And uh, what is a beekeeper doing here? Well, uh, I also spent 14 years of my life working in Silicon Valley. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, currently we're doing chemical plant protection. This is pretty much the dominant system. Uh, as a beekeeper, I'm not very happy about that because there is quite a bit of collateral damage, not just the typo in the slide. And um, one of the reasons is the pesticides used have been uh, getting more and more toxic. Uh, where now the current generation is about 7,000 times more toxic to bees than DDT. Uh, why is this going on? Because the industry uh, is the chemical industry and for somebody whose only tool is a hammer, every problem is a nail. Uh, everybody in the industry, in the sector, thinks chemistry is the only way to protect plants. I think um, there are other industries uh, that made the same mistake 20 years ago. Photography was all wet chemistry, and this is what happened to the company that didn't get the message that this can also be done digitally. So. Um, uh, right now, there's a big buzz uh, in the farm industry. They've discovered that uh, the digital revolution is happening, but they're essentially busy digitizing the old model, uh, taking the big tractors, putting GPS on it. Essentially, they're busy eliminating the farmer. Uh, but uh, some people are already uh, working in a different direction. They see that uh, uh, the digital revolution can change the model completely. Um, and there is a paradigm shift that uh, we can use as a model that is already happening. The old model in lawn care is that uh, I cut the lawn every two weeks. Uh, the lawn is this high and uh, I need a big tractor, uh, a big um, lawn mower to get that job done. The new model is I use uh, a, a robot the robot is always there, that's essential. So the problem that uh, the big machine here uh, is solving doesn't even arise in the new model. Um, there are some companies that are already working in this direction, but um, 
They come from the traditional farming sector and what they're building is very expensive, very heavy. And if you build an expensive machine, it needs to uh, work fast to earn its money back. I think there's a different model, and it's not just myself, but there are a whole bunch of people that are already working on this. Um, if the machine is cheap, it can be slow. It doesn't need to be fast to, be its, uh, to earn its money back. It can actually be always on the field, just like the lawn mowing robot does. And that changes a whole bunch of parameters uh, and makes certain problems actually solvable. Um, there are competitions from different universities already, um, uh, but they look like toy cars uh, driving around in certain uh, uh, fields. Uh, we built uh, something different. Can you start the uh, video uh, on here, or is this the PDF file? This is the PDF, uh, I don't okay. have a video, sorry. All right, anyway, we built a prototype in order to get the cost down. We uh, used uh, bicycle technology, electric bicycle technology, in-hub uh, motors and things like that to build a very low-cost platform to host the intelligence on. Why not drones? Also, the farming magazines are full of uh, stories about using drones, but drones uh, use a whole bunch of energy to stay in the air. Uh, once they discover something, they cannot exert force to do anything about it. So um, we think we need to take the technology that people are playing with uh, in drones, put it on a stable, low-cost platform, and get rid of uh, chemicals. Uh, I think our friends in the food hacking sector want to work with pesticide-free ingredients as well. And uh, so if you are interested in taking this uh, farming revolution in a whole different direction, help with the rover, help with image processing, with actors and sensors, please contact me. There's also more information on the wiki for the lightning talks. Don't try to go to the main wiki. It's been down for the whole conference, but the mirrors are working. Thank you very much. Uh, just a question, is the video online? So, okay, so the video can be seen uh, using the wiki link. Then we have the final talk, uh, not just made in China. For this one, I'll have to start my browser. I mean, I already have it open here, but I have to move it over, move over, over. So it should work now. I think it's full screen. OK. Yeah. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Ellis. Uh, you can interact with this presentation at the uh, VGood um, URL just down there. I'll just give you a minute to do that. I'd like to introduce myself. I am an online blogger and uh, journalist. I'm really into open source. And a couple of years ago, I was finding it very frustrating to raise money for doing what I was doing because my crime was I was telling the truth. And the truth doesn't pay. So I realized something. I realized that if there is a problem, you are the problem. And I had to go and solve this problem myself. I have a background in coding. When I was young, I was very fortunate to have a father who taught me how to code. I used to do machine language and assembly, actually. Um, and so I commissioned, in fact, I'm, I'm no good at these high-level languages nowadays. JavaScript does my head in. So I recruited a friend to program a, a project called ProTip, uh, which is a free open source project. Um, it's a Bitcoin wallet that runs in the Chrome browser. It automatically detects Bitcoin addresses on web pages. There is no need for you to install any malware on your website, I'm sorry, um, some JavaScript on your website that masquerades the button that then phones home back to a centralized API so they can track all your data. There is no surveillance model in this, in this paradigm. You simply need, as an artist or a creator or a web host, to put a Bitcoin address on your page. This, this is how you win at the internet, okay? You install ProTip, you install an ad blocker running through Tor, and you pay the artist directly and you block the ads. That's how you win at the internet. You pay the artist directly, peer to peer, for less than like a, a tenth of a cent or less than a twentieth of a cent. Advertising is just a recommendation from someone you don't trust. And the advertising used to work in the old days because you knew you could trust the ad because of the amount of money that went into putting it onto a centralized broadcasting network. When Google invented AdWords, they made ads cheap. And so the signal is now noisy. We can't trust it anymore. So this works on popular websites like XKCD. Even if it's buried very at the bottom in the, in the footer, it will find it for you, even if it's in the HTML header, actually. 
Um, this is it working on a decentralized um, system using IPFS. You saw the IPFS talking guy talking earlier. This is actually a sort of IPFS gateway that's run by Alexandria.media. The guys there are really great. We can, you can talk to them later at four o'clock downstairs in hall four. And this is the developer. He did all the hard work, okay? All I did is I did the campaigning. I'm an activist. I'm not really a coder. I mean, I know code, I get code, but I'm not, you know, really, really into it. So this is Leo Campbell. He deserves most of the credit. Please fork this before Silicon Valley does, because you know what they're going to do. They're just going to reversion the code. So, I, you know, developers are, are artists too. And so I wanted to create something. Because Bitcoin is a light wallet, I wanted to create this. This is a little freedom device. It's called a full node. It's got a Bitcoin full node running on it right now. If I get a battery out, one of these sort of batteries you can get for the e-cigarettes. I can get this going. Okay, so right now it is booting up. It's going to sync with the Wi-Fi network. I configured this just now before I came up here. And it's going to start distributing Bitcoin blocks. It's going to go in through Tor. It's got GNU PG. It's got all these things listed here. Open VPN that's ready to go with Mulvad VPN so you can pay them in cash or in Bitcoin anonymously. It's got IPFS if you're a journalist in, in a country like Venezuela, for example. Um, sorry, wrong slide. If you're a country in Venezuela, for example, and you're subject to censorship, you don't have to worry about that because you can simply publish things. I'd really, really like to get secure drop on here, but I don't know how. So if anyone would like to help me, please step forward. My Twitter account is there in the bottom right-hand corner of these slides. My pledge to you is that in the year 2016, I will make 500 of these regardless of what impact it has on my health or my living standards. I live very frugally. I live in a council flat in North London. I will make as many of these as possible. I've made 20 already live on air. You can check out the videos the links in the, in the presentation slide. Um, I, I also document everything I do contemporaneously. So we live stream this out on, on Google, unfortunately, but I'm, you know, uh, reality is the reality. And I, I teach people what I'm doing as I'm doing it. I, I even live stream my mistakes, right? Even the mistakes that I make um, go live on air. And this is currently the distribution of Bitcoin full nodes on, on the network. You can see it's very heavily centralized. This project really is about giving people permission to connect and to be discovered, regardless of where they are in the world. So not only can you buy one of these from me directly, you can build it at CC0, the actual license on my, on my GitHub. The link is coming up in just a moment. But already we've had seven people pledge these nodes. This is Alakanani. She's in Botswana. Um, I can't show you all the others for obvious reasons. They're in places like India and Venezuela. And, and I can't reveal to you their identities, but I'm, I'm going to send them uh, one of these so that they can start to report honestly on what is going on in, in their country. So. Thanks very much. If you could just click on that, that video for me, that would be great. You can join me at 4 o'clock in Hall 4 next to the cloakroom. This is how you get there. You walk through that main hall. It's south to Rechtenseite, and then out to Rechtenseite again, and out to Lincolnseite, and then it's there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this concludes uh, the lightning talk sessions of this Congress. I think we saw lots of interesting projects, lots of new information. Lots of great people here on the stage. We had, uh, I think, in total 60 speakers. So a big warm round of applause for all the people who participated, please.